Richard Jackson will read a uh, second. This is his most recent book, Resonance. Richard Jackson. Thank you. And thank you for coming and uh, thank Tom and this terrific program you've got going here. I think um, four poems will get us through this. In the 90s, I worked with the um, Penn uh, Peace Committee in Sarajevo and, um, and Slovenia during the Yugoslav Wars and took place in Bosnia and Kosovo. And so this first poem comes from, from that. It is called um, Objects in this Mirror Are Closer Than They Appear. <clears throat> Can you hear me okay back there? Because the dawn empties its pockets of our nightmares. Because the wings of birds are dusty with fear. Because another war has eaten its way into the granary of stars. What can console us? Is there so little left to love? Is belief just the poacher's searchlight that always blinds us? And memory just the tracer rounds of desire? Last night under the broken rudder of the moon, Soldiers cut a girl's finger off for the ring, then shot her and the boy who tried to hide under a cloak of woods beyond their Kosovo town. Listen to me. We have become words without meanings, rituals learned from dried riverbeds and the cellars of firebombed houses. Excuses flutter their wings. Another mortar round is arriving from the hills. How long would you say it takes despair to file down a heart? When this morning you woke beside me, you were mumbling how yesterday our words seemed to brush over the marsh grass, the way those herons planed over a morning of ground birds panicking in their nests. When my father left me his GI compass, telling me it was to keep me from losing myself, I never thought where it had led him or would lead me. Today, beside you, I remembered simply the way you eat a persimmon and thought it would be impossible for each drop of rain not to want to touch you. Maybe the names of these simple objects, returning this morning like falcons, will console us. Maybe we can love it not just within the darkness, but because of it. Ours is the dream of the snail hoping to leave its track on the moon. We are sending signals to worlds more distant than what radio astronomers can listen for, and yet, and yet what? Maybe your seeds of daylight will take root. Maybe it is for you the sea lifts its shoulders to the moon. For you the smoke of some battle takes the shape of a tree. On your balconies of desire, in your alleyways of touch, each object is a door opening like the luminous face of a pocket watch. Maybe because of you, the stars, too, desire one another across their infinite, impossible distances forever. So that it is not unthinkable that some bird skims the narrow sky where the sentry fires have dampened, where the soldier stacking guns in death's courtyard might look up and remember touching some story he carries in his pockets, a morning like this blazing through the keyholes of history, seeing not his enemy, but those lovers, reaching for each other, reaching towards any of us, their words splintering on the sky, and the gloves of their hands looking for anyone's heart. Night sky. Can you believe what the eloquence of these asteroids tells us? That we are thrown through space from one explosion to another? How amazing any love is endured. In spite of the fact that so many tendrils of hope wither in the sun, in spite of the way the flower now seems to feed on the bird bees, that the lake seems to shackle the sky, that the roots pull down the tree, in spite of the fact that the clouds drag the earth towards some new final solution, 
It doesn't matter where. There's a whole alphabet of hate, a syntax of torture we can hardly understand. Petrified promises take the day by the hand and lead her off into some jungle. A couple of cigarettes walk towards the dark end of a pier. A child's music shatters like a broken violin. I used to think that any love we could find is enough. It isn't. It isn't enough to plant our precious gardens of hope in the sky. It isn't enough to write by the fading candle of our eyes. It isn't enough to read some future by the petals of the flower. Never enough. We have to understand this love in the way the thorn defends it. We can't let the moon rest its drowsy head on our rooftops. We have to capture every way would flash in the night sky and not let our words burn up in the atmosphere. We have to follow wherever they are heading. Sometimes I think we're all hurtling through love at the speed of light. Maybe it is a question of what galaxy we will crash into. Even now, you have to hear what the arrow says before it strikes. You have to know I will follow you over rivers of stone, even while you hold my heart in your fist. That every love is filled with guilt. Every love tries to conquer a new world. I think sometimes we breathe through the pores of the earth. It is the only way we know the soul's body. The only way we can pass over the hobbled roads of hate. The only way to shudder as the bird shudder crossing the horizon. I'm watching a bat scoop the emptiness from the night. Watching the hackberry tree embrace the moon. Sometimes we have to hold hands with our own nightmares. When I tell you that the voice of the nightingale turns dark, you have to understand what this love is trying to overcome. You have to know that if you ever leave, if you ever disappear, the sky would rip and the stars would lose their way. I saw uh, Dan Beach out there before, and. Uh, from the Atlanta Review, and this poem first uh, appeared in there, so I thought I'd read it for him. This is called Look Both Ways Before Crossing. I never know what to do with titles. <laughs> or street signs, pretty good metaphors. <clears throat> <clears throat> Why is this moment not like that last moment, which just now the owl's cry tried to erase? You heard it, that cry from deep within the body. Nothing like the blades of sunset that went ripping through the clouds a moment ago. Nothing like the wounded air the child breathed a moment ago, the pliers tearing at his nails in a place linked to us forever by that moment. Not his hands of ash, the sky suddenly full of tongues, the heart smoldering in the ruins of his past. How can this moment even exist after that other moment? This moment when you arrive, your wings opening, your hips taking the shape from my palms, our timid shadows embracing timidly. How could that other moment even exist where the child's cries spread out like light from a dying star, where we all seem dusted by lamplight, when the flower shuddered from the early frost? Why are we here, not there, a place where the sky beats its wings and flies away? where the road is already tired, where love tends its bruises. Why are the loves we inherit this moment always a kind of death? The girl who believed the empty husks of my own or anyone's dreams, my mother's lungs tightening round her tumors, the torn sail of my father's mind, his words like loose kites wiping the sky clean. But even so, how could that child's moment even exist? There's a hoarse voice calling us back towards whatever terrifies us, which is why at this moment the moonlight seems to drown in the river, while the city lights only seem to suffocate the stars. In another moment, the tight fist of someone's brain might think of a new way to seed pain, or the dried blooms of some disease find a way to revive behind the whisper of the clocks. But for this moment, not like those other moments, it is simply so surprising to be alive with you. Why is it enough just to listen to the earth spin? Why is it at this moment, despite the fact that our hearts beat at 60 fears a second, despite the fact that at this moment the silence of our dreams is immense, 
we can offer each other in our world, these unforgettable petals of frost unfolding on their stems. Okay, so this is the caboose of this reading. In fact, they stole that train. It's down here in Georgia someplace. <laughs> it's just called otherness. It is part of our disguise that our dreams are lived by someone else. Thales dreamt an eclipse in 570 BC and stopped a war. You arrived subconsciously in a sentence I was reading from a book I never finished. What we say gets its meaning from what we don't say. Persephone kept her love hidden underground. So much of what we feel is habit. We need to search for a way to say what is real. The air filled with the simple pungency of cut grass, the flowers barely breathing, the black and azure butterflies mating in clusters by the side of the trail, the melancholy taste of blackberries some bear had abandoned at my approach. The stag that lifts its head unconcerned. Whatever drifts away, whatever stays. How do we keep our own dreams from touching each other? I remember as a boy fearing for the snail as it crawled out from its shell. I imagined the love. I couldn't coax it back. What we do is a metaphor for what we don't do. These are the only ways to tell you what I mean. In Chagall's drawings, the faces of his lovers are surprised by their own sadness that they have not become one of his angels smudged across the sky. The knights disguise themselves among the noontime shadows. At the tomb, Mary Magdalene thought Jesus was a gardener. What we know gets its meaning from what we don't know. It is why we create stories for those Mayan cities still buried beneath the jungles of Mexico. Everything's a metaphor. Those butterflies on the trail I mentioned, for instance, I thought they carried part of the sky on their wings. Or the cloud rising like a ruined column from some ancient site supporting the sky's idea of it. In a while, the wind convinces it to collapse as it does for so many of our dreams. What we dream gets its meaning from what we don't dream. Memory betrays us. The sentence I read as you appeared was a piece of smooth ocean glass when Nicholas of Cusa dreamt of spiritual beings living near the sun. Annex Amanda knew we emerged from sea creatures. What if you had appeared with those few snowy egrets this morning who seemed puzzled or fearful in my presence? What we love gets its meaning from what we don't love. The air here seems filled with fragments of some other day. In a drawing I saw once, my words shivered for how the stag gazed tenderly at the wolves, as if to say they had no other choice, as if to forgive them as they ate so ravenously from its side. No, never again have I dreamt such a perfect love. Thank you.